So we've derived a, a first relation that's very important to analyze the model, and that was the aggregate demand curve. Now, uh, I want to compute the aggregate supply curve, which will be the second relation uh, that will be really key in analyzing um, our uh, model of slack uh, BFs. So, uh, if, if we go back to <coughs> the aggregate demand curve, um, So we, we had um, we had to think about two things. Um, so we we fi we figured out how much um, households wanted to consume, but then we realized that uh, in fact households would have to purchase more services than that because part of the services that they, that they, they have to purchase is to uh, f uh, be able to visit. Uh, various um, shops and sellers and be able to uh, find, you know, the goods and services that they want to buy. So um, when we looked at aggregate demand, in, in a way, they were, we were looking implicitly at two different concepts of aggregate demand. One, a demand for consumption um, that was based on, you know, utility maximization, subject to budget constraint. And then we realized that um, there was a, a a demand for not consumption but um, purchases um, of transactions um, that was larger than that and the gap between these two things was due to the service that was going to be allocated um, to um, matching with a seller and so um, in a sense that's very close to the concept that we uh, that were discussed in the disequilibrium, the disequilibrium literature between uh, a notional demand um, which would be ideally how much you would like to, to demand and then an effective demand, which is, you know, what you're going to demand. So in the disequilibrium literature, it was given the disequilibrium on other markets. Um, so given that you were in a disequilibrium world. So here there is a little bit this idea. There's a notional demand, which is how much you would like to demand if there was no, uh, if you were outside of a matching framework. And then in a way, an effective demand, which is bigger than the notional demand, um, because you're in a matching framework and, and you have to uh, spend and allocate services to actually matching with uh, with a seller. Um, and so I'm going back to that because in, in the case of the aggregate supply, we'll have exactly the same uh, situation. Um, so let me just um, summarize this. So, in the case of aggregate demand, uh, so we saw that there was, in a way, a notional demand demand for uh, consumption and that was computed by maximizing utility subject uh, to a budget constraint. And then, uh, but of course, that's, and that's not what we um, used as aggregate demand. Then there was an effective demand, which is, it was a demand for um, purchases. Why? Uh, so if you want purchases or it's a demand for transactions or the amount of services that will be transacted. And uh, 
choses these are more than consumption because um, some services must be allocated to uh, matching with um, sellers. And you remember this is again because each visit cost raw services. In fact, the link between the two things is that we know that that y the xp is just 1 plus tau x times cd on xp. That's the key link. Uh, And the tau x that shows is uh, the matching wedge, which is strictly bigger than zero because a uh, row is strictly bigger than zero. So in a way, um, what you have here is that could say that you, you know, if you wanted to um, represent this graphically, just uh, symbolically at a, at a high level where here you would have um, services and here you would have tightness. And so here you would have CD, XP, and then you would have YD, the XP, and then you would have a, a gap between these two things here. And, uh, and that gap is really caused by the matching structure, and in particular, uh, in particular, the aggregate demand is going to be, the effective aggregate demand will be more than the notional aggregate demand, which would be closer to the demand that, you know, the notional demand would be kind of, a, you could, you know, that's what you would have in a, in a Valrasian world, whereas our aggregate demand here is very specific to the matching world, and the difference between the two is due to the presence of the matching cost. Because of the matching cost, our aggregate demand, um, you know, that we'll use here would be bigger than the one that you would have in a Valrasian world, which is just directly based on uh, how much people want to consume. So for the aggregate demand, we had to separate between um, consumption that's demanded and purchases that are demanded, um, or if you want, services that are going to be um, consumed, which is this uh, aggregate demand CD of XP, and services that are actually bought, which is more than the services that are consumed due to the matching cost, which is YD of XP. Now, getting back to the aggregate supply, it'll be exactly the same. We'll have to separate between two notions of aggregate supply. Um, so, <clears throat> So here in this model, the natural you know, notion of aggregate supply would be to ask, okay, how many services in the aggregate um, do households want to supply? And this we know every household supplies um, K services inelastically. Um, and therefore in the aggregate, we have K services that are going, you know, that, that household would like um, to sell. Um, and so this corresponds exactly to what the Valrasian aggregate supply would be. Uh, 
Um, what's the amount of services? You know, at the given price, how many services in the aggregate do we want to supply? And that's going to be K. Um, so here, this would be exactly a Valerasian aggregate supply. So this, this is going to be, if you want, our notional aggregate supply. So this notion of aggregate supply would be K. Um, this is the amount of services that households uh, would like to sell. You know, at the you know at the given price. But here, um, the supply of services is elastically, so um, this is irrelevant. We could imagine a more complicated setup where the amount of services that they want to supply depend on the on the price level. Uh, okay, but in the same way as for aggregate demand, the effective aggregate demand was uh, actually more than uh, the notional aggregate demand. Here for the supply, it's going to be the same. The effective aggregate supply will actually be less than the notional aggregate supply. And why will we have a gap? Well, it's because um, the amount of services that uh, households can actually sell is strictly less than the amount of services that they would like um, to sell that they put on the market. And that's because we have, a, you know, we have a matching function uh, through which uh, households find uh, buyers. And because of that matching function, you only sell each service with a given probability that's strictly less than one. Um, so here, similarly, we'll have an effective aggregate supply, and this is the aggregate supply that we are going to use in the analysis. So what is the effective aggregate supply? Uh, it's the amount of services <coughs> sold given uh, tightness you know, and price, you know, because the price could affect how many services households would like to sell. But here it's going to be, it's not going to depend on the price here in this special case where supply is inelastic. Uh, so the effective aggregate supply is the amount of services sold given, uh, given the current market tightness. Um, and so it's effective in the sense that exactly like the effective aggregate demand looks at transactions, the amount of services that have to be purchased. The effective aggregate supply also looks at uh, transactions. These are the amount of services that are actually sold. And, um, and in that way, it also goes back to the effect notion of effective demand and supply in this equilibrium model that are demand and supply uh, that, that looks actually at quantities that are transacted. These are the amount of services that are transacted or traded. So it's effective in the sense against services. So here I'm spending a bit of time talking about this because these are notion of aggregate demand, aggregate supply that are unique to the matching model. It's not something that you would find in um, Valrasian model or even you know like a New Keynesian model that, in which you have monopolistic competition. Um, So these are services sold given the matching structure that we've assumed. Okay, so this is the concept of ag uh, aggregate supply uh, that we'll use here. And so what's nice is that, and something I want to flag here, is that uh, the notions of aggregate demand and aggregate supply, AD and AS, are consistent. They both look, they both measure um, services that are traded. So the aggregate demand is uh, amount of services that the households want to buy, so therefore trade. And this one, the aggregate supply is the amount of services that the household is able to sell, therefore trade. Um, 
And so this will be good because you'll see once we solve the model, one condition that we'll use is that aggregate supply is equal to aggregate demand always at, at any point in time, because of course any service that's sold is a service that's bought by another household. So the fact that we focus on transactions, on number of trades will allow us to always have equality of supply and demand. Also, we're in a model of Slack, you know, some models in which usually you use this equilibrium model where demand and supplies are not equal. But here, thanks to by recasting demand and supply in terms of, of trades, we're able to always have supplies equal to demand in the model, um, which will be very convenient. So we'll be able And we'll see that later of AD and AS at any time. Okay, so uh, now that we've defined this aggregate supply that we are looking for, so it's the amount of services that are sold um, given tightness. So can we compute it? Well, yes, it's going to be um, pretty simple. Uh, so here's the expression for the aggregate supply for the AS curve. So uh, the AS curve will going to denote it Y because it's an amount of services that are traded. We'll put an S because it's a supply. And we'll see that it depends. It's not going to depend on the price. That's not an argument, but it's going to depend on tightness. So the aggregate supply is supposed to tell us for a given tightness. Uh, and, you know, I guess uh, we could allow for a price, but we'll see that it doesn't depend on it. Uh, but generically, it could depend on, on the price um, that's going to be sold given current tightness and given price. So now, how many uh, services are actually sold given tightness and price? Well, we know that at any point in time, household supply K services in the aggregate. But we know that only each service is only sold with a probability f of x, um, you know, so, uh, you know, which is our uh, selling probability f of x where x is tightness. And so in the aggregate, the amount of services that are sold is just going to be f of x times k. Well, you recognize f of x is a selling probability that we computed earlier. And so the expression for the aggregate demand is just this. It's f of x times k. So this is very simple. And so we see the, for the aggregate supply. Um, and so it's only a function of tightness here. So this is going to be our aggregate supply. It's just f of x times k. So if we want to just formalize the definition of the aggregate supply here, now that we have experience, so it's the amount of services sold given the matching structure. Um, and you know, the amount of services brought or supplied um, to the market by the sellers, which here are just the households. So in that way, it's an aggregate supply. It's the amount of services that would be sold given the take into account the matching structure and the amount of services that are going to be supplied to the market. And in the same way uh, that we had a gap between, you know, the kind of Valrasian idea of aggregate demand and what we consider aggregate demand in the model here, we'll have a gap between the Valrasian idea of supply and what we consider aggregate supply in the, in the model. So we can represent that uh, in a stylized way. So if we put again services here and tightness on the y-axis, you know, as in uh, the Marshallian tradition of, uh, right, so here, you know, we'll have 
so we'll have kind of a, a Valrasian. Sorry, I can actually. Uh, so we'll have a Valrasian notion of aggregate supply. And so here, you know, it's just equal to k. That's the, you know how many at a given price, how many services do you want to sell. Um, but here, once again, we'll have a gap between that Valrasian notion of aggregate supply and the matching notion of aggregate supply, because the matching notion of aggregate supply looks at how many services will be traded, actually, given how much you bring to the market. So it's going to look, you know, if we just uh, have a just a kind of symbolic representation, it's going to look something like this. We'll see it be less. <clears throat> And so this I should have. So we'll have a kind of a matching notion of aggregate supply. Uh, and the gap between the two things here, why, why is this matching notion less than the Valrasian notion is because not all services are sold due to the matching function. You know, the matching function governs trades, the number of trades. So the matching supply will be less. Uh, okay, and so uh, that's quite interesting that you have on both the aggregate demand, aggregate supply in the Valrasian world. Uh, and then, I, and then you know, in between, we have this aggregate demand and aggregate supply in the matching world that represents transactions that can, uh, that will actually occur um, with gaps created by the matching cost and the matching function. <clears throat>